Okay, I think we're gonna finally be able to start. I'm so sorry about that. So, so I, I'm just gonna very quickly say that I'm very thankful, grateful to have Amy Reed Sandoval here for UNNLV. She's gonna be our inaugural speaker, speaker for our series, Immigrate, Immig Immig ah, Immigrants, Refugees, and Asylum Seekers. And she's gonna talk to us about fem uh, feminism and, and the, uh, uh, ah, sorry, feminism and the open border debate. Can borders be feminist? Thank you so much. Or, um, the oh, yeah, let me give you a few there. Yeah, that is your slide. Okay, yeah. should I sit down and... It's up to okay. you. You, you, the, you can see, I can move the camera in here if you prefer okay. to stand. Yeah. Is that, is that the convention that the speaker sits? It's, so. There's no convention. Okay, I'm all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great, I'll just... Yeah, that's that's the slide. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, thank yeah, you. Yeah, so I, uh, I don't think I have a remote. That... That's okay. No, this is this is great. It's a very cozy space. It feels nice and warm. Thank you for for being here and for hosting me. Um, should I? I write in. Yes. Yeah, so, so thank you. Um, I will uh, go ahead and uh, get started. I want to um, start with a quote um, from the philosopher Peter Higgins. He published this piece in Hypatia uh, in his article, A Feminist Approach to Immigrant Admissions. And here's a quote, and I should just say, I think that he's right um, in saying this. Um, Higgins wrote that almost entirely absent from philosophical debates about immigrant admissions is a feminist perspective. Uh, and that just happens to be true. Um, and so um, I, I I want to um, uh, help address uh, this kind of lacuna in today's presentation. And kind of in the spirit of what I'm doing, I like to think a little bit about the metaphor of occupying the open borders debate. So not saying that we should do away with it, but what I want to argue is that there should be more direct and explicit feminist intervention in the open borders debate. And in so doing, I think that we should change the shape of the conversation. And so I'm going to kind of zoom out in today's uh, presentation. Um, many of my comments are not about a particular argument made by particular theorists working in the open borders debate. It's more of a state of the a state of the literature a kind of approach and an argument for a certain type of feminist involvement in this debate, which I think would eventually be very uh, productive. So to go back in time a bit, um, Alex Steger um, has this really important edited volume called The Ethics and Politics of Immigration. So when I started thinking about the open borders debate as a feminist, it was at Steger's prompting. He said, well, write this overview of the state of the open borders debate. And I noticed in, in trying to write this piece that there seemed to be a gap in terms of different approaches to thinking about borders um, and the rights of migrants, right? And so um, I think that um, one side of the debate we might call the classical open borders debate and the other side of the debate we might call the new open borders debate. It's a strange way of phrasing it, right? Because there are people arguing for more open or more uh, closed borders on kind of both sides within this division. But um, I, I very much didn't want to leave out feminist work on borders in this overview of the literature, but I did notice some distance in terms of these different approaches and so I try to um, coin these two uh, terms to talk about different approaches to theor theorizing borders and migration. So in broad strokes, uh, what I call the classical open borders debate, here are some features. First of all, it considers whether abstract borders and border controls could ever be justified in an ideal world. Um, it's mainly focused on two related questions. First of all, do states have a prima facie right to exclude prospective migrants? And secondly, is there a universal right to migration? On the other side, we have what I call the new open borders debate, which features like a more bottom up, non ideal theory. Um, it tends to draw central conclusions from particularities. Um, often, folks who are working in the areas of feminist philosophy, Latinx philosophy, decolonial, and global South philosophies tend to not, not explicitly position their work in the new open borders debate, because I just kind of made up this term, right? But I, I kind of characterize it as falling under that rubric. Um, these sorts of questions, the, the projects in the new open borders debate, I argued, are connected to these kind of classical open borders debate questions, but may not directly engage them. Um, and I should say, um, some theorists uh, do work, oh, sorry, can, I, can you help me go backwards? I'm trying to go backwards rather than forwards, oh. but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Apologies, there we go. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, so at the time, I was very optimistic. When I when I wrote the piece, it was before the pandemic, right? A different point in my career. I thought, you know, these two debates are actually going to merge together. We're not going to see this gap. And I think there are some very important examples of a kind of merging along these lines. Uh, so first of all, you know, Joseph, Joseph Karens has long argued for the importance of both realistic and idealistic approaches to uh, theorizing uh, immigration ethics. Um, subsequent, subsequently, after I, I published this, this chapter in the Edited volume. Um, Karen's uh, published about shifting uh, presuppositions in political theory, the idea that when we're theorizing migration or kind of working um, in the realm of political theory, we might think about a spectrum, right? On one part of the spectrum, we find these kinds of universal or um, idealized approaches. On the other end, we have more realistic, non-ideal approaches. Of course, um, please correct me if I'm wrong in, uh, in this representation. Um, so I saw that I kind of see that as um, us kind of merging the two debates together in these important ways. Alex Sager um, published a 2020 Defense of Open Borders in which um, he argues for open borders in both a top-down and a bottom-up fashion. So his kind of more top-down fashion is a little bit more Rawlsian, right? I'm going to use these more abstract principles of justice to argue for open borders. But then he does this interesting bottom-up work as well, where he says, well, look, even if we grant to states this kind of prima facie right to maintain coercive borders and exclude migrants, if you look at how immigration enforcement mechanisms happen on the ground, we realize that, that immigration enforcement me mechanisms, they're being, they're being enforced in a very racist and inegalitarian manner. So even if you grant states this right, we still can't have closed borders, he ultimately argues, right? So it's top down and bottom up. Peter Higgins, in his aforementioned article, also provides a kind of non-ideal feminist approach to immigrant admissions, um, which he thinks can be applied um, perhaps on a global scale, but in, but in a careful way. Um, so I, I, I think there are reasons to be optimistic, but I do ultimately believe that a significant gap remains uh, between these kinds of classical and new approaches to the open borders debate. So I would say uh, with, with Karen's uh, kind of articulation of shifting presuppositions in political theory, if I'm reading it correctly, you can only be on one part of the spectrum at a time, right? So you're kind of in ideal territory or you're in realistic uh, territory. Uh, again, open, open to debate about that. That's kind of my, my read, though I regard it as an important methodological move. Alex Sager's kind of non-ideal bottom-up approach, it, it tends to be kind of more focused on immigration injustices in the United States, in Western Europe, right? It's not a, a, a global non-ideal theory of immigration justice. And Peter Higgins is pretty explicit in saying like, look, I don't think that we can actually develop a kind of universal feminist approach to immigration ethics. He tries to get us in that direction, but as, as I read it, there's still this kind of gap there. So my aims for today's discussion are to begin to develop a universal ethical framework for considering core questions of the classical open borders debate, but from a feminist decolonial perspective, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, more in today's presentation. I shall argue that feminist decolonial engagement of the motivating questions of the classical open borders debate can and should displace the false universalism and Western idealizations that figure prominently in mainstream Anglo-American immigration ethics. And just to reiterate, this is not a criticism of any particular theorist working within the classical open borders debate. It's more of a state of the literature and how I think immigration ethics has tended to develop and the kinds of moves that people are making. It should also, I argue, be a universal framework, helping us to consider whether borders and bordering practices could ever be justified, and if they are something that we should ultimately advocate for in the context of decolonial and climate futures. So uh, how my presentation is organized, I'm going to begin to identify and motivate what I consider to be a series of possible objections to feminist involvement, explicit feminist involvement in the classical open borders debate. This is not to say that people working in the debate are not in fact feminists, right? But I'm talking about people intervening in the debate explicitly as feminists and using uh, feminist political philosophy. Um, I think this is really important because this, this this presentation, this, this chapter, um, is about creating space for a certain type of dialogue. And I want to capture why I think there's been this kind of feminist resistance for getting uh, to, to getting directly involved in the open borders debate. So Higgins in his piece says, I'm not even going to try to diagnose this problem. I'm not going to try and explain why feminists haven't get, got, gotten involved. That would be foolhardy. I'm going to do that foolhardy thing and try to explain it today. Um, so perhaps I should have taken uh, heated Higgins' advice. You can let me know in the Q&A. 
Um, then I'm going to respond to these objections in part by calling upon Serene Potter's transnational and decolonial feminist ethic. And then I'm going to argue positively that there are important reasons for feminists to pursue the open borders question uh, via a universal framework. Okay, so let me just start with some what I consider to be some possible feminist objections to the framing of the classical open borders debate. I, I see this as perhaps initiating a type of hard conversation that I think we have to have about why there's been a certain reluctance to kind of wade into uh, th this philosophical territory. So the first objection, I'll spend some more time on, 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 on some rather than others. The first objection I'll spend the most time talking about I believe that, that some feminists have asked this question would argue that the world's borders are just so obviously harmful to women and other vulnerable groups that seriously questioning whether they are permissible is simply absurd, if not offensive, right? Because obviously making an argument for or against open borders involves taking the question seriously, right? And so I think some folks might say, well, look, I mean, this is so obviously wrong that why should I devote my time as a philosopher to, you know, actually unpacking it and taking it seriously? So let's just talk about this. How are many borders harmful to women and other vulnerable groups? Well, we can consider some arguments from the classical open borders debate. Um, borders, many borders tend to undermine personal autonomy, right? Even if we we, we take perhaps as our example, a more privileged, as social, a socially privileged migrant um, as Kieran Oberman does, right? Just think about someone who would like to cross a certain border and maybe to learn about the politics or the religion of another country, or, you know, wants to pursue, wants to marry someone who's living across a border, right? And the border is just standing in the way, prohibiting people from doing that. And that just seems wrong and it's, and it's frustrating and it's undermining autonomy. Um, some have argued, right, that borders make it even more difficult for people who find themselves in desperate circumstances to improve their life circumstances by crossing borders, right? So maybe someone is, is facing poverty, persecution, right? Um, there's, there's, a, there's a lack of local resources to improve one's situation. So what's an alternative? Well, you know, crossing a border, moving to a comparatively, you know, wealthy and secure nation to improve one's life circumstances, but you can't do that because there is this violent, coercive border standing in your way. Borders subject many people to unjustified coercion, right? From a democratic theory perspective, you might say, right, borders, I mean, not, not everyone has a say in which borders are getting drawn where, and, and that is problematic. And so these borders are just coercing, you know, the world's vulnerable uh, people in all these uh, terrible ways. Um, Arash Abizadeh makes an argument along these lines. And so we might say from a feminist perspective, right, women constitute the majority of the world's poor. They're subjected to very high levels of domination and coercion. So these issues seem to be immediate factors feminist concerns. So again, why as a feminist should I spend time, you know, making arguments like within the framework of the open borders debate? We might also consider some arguments from what I've called the new open borders debate. Um, so many borders act as theaters of inequality. Um, Latinx philosophy of migration talks a lot about this, right? The way in which, for example, the U.S.-Mexico border is used um, in racist discourse. Um, it serves to marginalize um, people with a Latin American and Latinx identities, and that is that is wrongful. Um, again, th thinking about what I said about Sager's work, borders seem complicit or are complicit in racial injustice, given how their, their enforcement mechanisms play out on the ground. Um, what's been not, not as discussed is the way in which borders intersect with reproductive injustice, right? So folks who might want to cross borders uh, for abortion care or different types of pregnancy-related medical care might find themselves harassed and interrogated at borders about their intentions. Um, borders are also kind of complicit in a certain in a certain way, in a complicated way, in anti-LGBTQ harassment. Um, Aitne Louis Pied's work um, focuses on this as well, right? Um, she talks about the U.S.-Mexico border and demands for sexual confession on the part of border patrol agents who are I mean, interrogating people who are uh, perceived as being uh, LGBTQ. Settler borders um, disrespect indigenous sovereignty in very obvious ways. So again, the argument would be, why is this an interesting question to me as a feminist? Borders are so obviously problematic. Why should I get involved in this debate? And lastly, and this is the possible objection that I'm spending the most time on, um, we might think about some objections coming from a kind of feminist framework for peace. I'm not sure if uh, folks are familiar with this uh, important piece by Karen J. Warren and Dwayne L. Cady, um, but they talk about characteristics of an oppressive moral framework. Um, an oppressive moral framework, they argue, includes 
value hierarchical and up-down thinking in which everything up is seen to be more valuable uh, than everything down. An oppressive moral framework, they also argue, involves value dualisms or disjunctive pairs in which the disjuncts are seen as oppositional rather than complementary and as exclusive rather than inclusive. It also involves conceiving of power exclusively in terms of power over, privileging the interests of the ups, and a logic of domination that is a structure of domination which presumes that superiority justifies subordination. So how would we apply this to thinking about borders, the open borders debate? Obviously, many borders involve hierarchical and up-down thinking, like in a very literal in terms of how we position things on maps, right? They seem very directly involved in this process. They involve value dualisms, us versus them thinking, right? On what side of the border do you fall and how does that relate to your social identity? Uh, they're often forms of power over, right? Um, to, I, I talk about the US-Mexico border a lot, right? But often um, border agents um, on the United States side can murder Mexicans um, with impunity, right? There's clear power over um, happening at the border. And you might say, you know, maybe all borders are complicit in this, right? Maybe this is just true of all borders and again, as a feminist, why should I be involved in this project? It's so they're so obviously problematic. Why should I be involved? Okay, so that's I think the first possible objection that I think that a feminist might give to getting involved as a feminist in the open borders debate. A second objection, and the other objections I'll move through a little bit more quickly. I wanted to spend some time unpacking that one. The second objection might be that the classical open borders debate has been developed within a kind of universal ethical framework. And one might argue that universalism is necessarily tied to Western imperialism. Um, just uh, to, to cite one uh, decolonial thinker, the late Aníbal Quijano, the Peruvian uh, sociologist and philosopher, he described coloniality as, quote, a colonization of the imagination and a systematic repression of ways of knowing, of knowledge production, of the production of perspectives, of images and imagery systems, of resources, patterns, and instruments of formalized objective uh, intellectual or visual expression. So some might say, well, look, as soon as you start working within any kind of a universal ethical framework, you're actually falling into this trap of coloniality and you're suppressing alternatives. And that's ultimately harmful uh, to many marginalized people, colonized peoples. Okay, so two possible objections. The third, I mean, I think it's pretty straightforward. The classical open borders debate, one might argue, has not been developed explicitly from a feminist perspective, so it's disconnected from feminist concerns, right? So this is not, this isn't a feminist debate, so why should I as a feminist get involved in this debate, one might argue. Objection four, I'll spend a little bit more time talking about this one. One might argue, I think, that the framing of the classical open borders debate, including in this case, open borders arguments, one might argue that they conceal key things about the world that feminists need to evaluate. So I've been talking a lot thus far about just kind of seeing the borders as these oppressive places, which they often are, and not wanting to get involved in the debate as a feminist for that reason. Now we might consider feminist goals in relation to open borders arguments. So to think with for a moment, um, Gloria Ansaldúa, um, who argued that the U.S.-Mexican border is una herida abierta, an open wound where the third world grates against the first and bleeds. I'm not sure if folks have read, read Ansaldúa um, in this space, but she develops a theory of what she calls a, a mestiza consciousness that, uh, that, that develops, she argues, from uh, being a Chicana living in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. And it's a response to uh, the oppression that, that she and others situated as she is um, in, endured, endure um, in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, but it's also this kind of, in, in certain respects, an epistemically privileged position, right? You can see important things about the world and understand aspects of, of oppression that come from being situated at the U.S.-Mexico border. So you might say, I mean, Ansaldúa and her work, Borderlands, La Frontera, the New Mestiza, um, Ansaldu is being very critical of the U.S.-Mexico border and its politics, but Ansaldu actually needs the border to be there for her to theorize mestiza consciousness, right? So if she were working within an open borders paradigm, she wouldn't be able to talk about the issues that are extremely important to her as a Chicana theorist, right? And of course, this is uh, Joe Karens talks about this as well, saying you know sometimes you actually just need the border there to render visible certain types of oppression. One other example, um, so coming from some feminist work on migration is sometimes within feminist work, there are arguments on 
supporting borders to protect vulnerable women, which might be lost within an open borders framework, right? And so just to briefly talk about one example, this is a, this is a paper, a, a social science paper um, called Agenda for Immediate Attention to the Migrant Population in Puebla, Female Return Migrants in Puebla. This is a direct quote from an interview. Um, so this is a, a woman living in the Mixteca women, region of Puebla whose mother was going to force her to marry um, a man that she really didn't know. She had just met him and she was going to be forced into doing this. And she saw crossing the border into the United States as kind of her means of separating from her mother and not being forced to marry someone that she didn't want to marry. Um, I'll, I'll read it with you. So she said, one day a female cousin of mine came to visit me and I said, can you believe that my mom wants me to marry this person and she even invited him home and proposed to leave me alone with him I don't know if he wants to abuse me but the issue is that she leaves him alone with me what do I do and the cousin said to me look they're coming and she started to list so many people that were going to arrive and she said they're going back to the United States if you want let's go with them and I said but how will we do that if I tell my mom she won't let me go and she said well, anyway, let's go. And then the day came, my mom and dad weren't at home. It was just my siblings and me. And I said, well, it's now or never. If I don't leave, I'll have to marry him. So in, in this passage, she's talking about actually crossing the border into the United States to get this kind of protection and to protect her own autonomy in this important way. And again, I'm not saying that open borders theorists are not sensitive to these concerns. I think they absolutely are. But once again, as a, as a feminist who wants to work on, who wants to develop a theory that's attentive to these kinds of types of issues, you might say, well, does the open borders move really give one's conceptual space to really take seriously these kinds of concerns. Okay, so uh, we've gone through uh, several objections. Um, the, the last one is just that, you know, it's the debate has taken place in ideal theory and there's like feminist suspicion toward ideal theory. I'm sure everyone in this space is very familiar with those debates, right? But that's another objection, right? It's, it's taken place exclusively in the realm of ideal theory, at least the classical open borders debate. Okay, so th that's my take on why I think there, there might have been a reluctance on the part of uh, many feminist philosophers to get directly involved in the classical open borders debate, though there's been a lot of really important feminist work on, you know, in, in terms of what I call the new open borders debate. But now I actually want to make a case for a universal feminist ethics of borders, despite these objections. And I want to talk a little bit about Serene Cotter's book, Decolonizing Universalism, a Transnational Feminist Ethic. Not, not sure if folks are familiar uh, with the book. I found it very useful and kind of thinking about, obviously, I wouldn't be presenting on it today if I didn't find it useful for thinking about migration. Just a bit of context, in, in this book, Cotter is responding to a kind of impasse that she sees in feminist philosophy and activism. On the one hand, uh, seeing uh, kind of behaviors or works on the part of a certain feminist that she ca characterizes as being imperialist feminists that really see um, feminist activism as entailing, you know, making people develop kind of Western attitudes and institutions and mores. On the other hand, um, she sees a certain decolonial feminist saying, ultimately, you have to be a kind of moral relativist because if not, you're going to fall into this imperialist trap. And so she wants to make the case for a kind of de a decolonial uh, universalism. And here's how she motivates this. She says, first of all, um, feminists must be able to make non-relativist and cross-cultural cross claims about genuinely wrong forms of gender injustice. Um, she also points out that cultural relativism, too, can be used to legitimize the work of non-Western feminists who might be accused of uh, kind of embracing colonialism, right, or becoming too Western, right, in, when they engage in certain types of activism. She also points out that we need to engage in cross-cultural comparisons to reveal systemic global injustices, and we need universalism to impose imperialism on a global scale. Um, philosophers are usually pretty quickly kind of convinced of these arguments. I'll be interested to see you know, what, what folks think if anyone disagrees, but this is her motivation for writing this piece. Cotter says that rather than reject universalism, decolonial feminists should reject justice monism, uh, the view that there is only one sociocultural form of gender justice, that of wealthy Western nations, she calls this Western ide idealizations, to which women and other marginalized groups must be saved. This is the, this is the problematic move in a lot of kind of uh, imperialist feminist projects. She further argues that, quote, asserting that we should decolonize by making only very local normative claims accepts the terms of a debate that give the West a monopoly on universal morality. It says that either there are universally true claims about justice that originated in the West, 
or that there are no universally true claims about justice at all, end quote. Okay. So just a little to unpack her theory a little bit more, her theory of decolonial feminist universalism or universalist feminism, she's talking about moral universalism here, which she defines as the notion that some things are better and worse for human beings across all contemporary contexts. Um, she defines feminism as a kind of universal opposition to feminist oppression. And she argues that imperialist feminist practice does not come from feminism status as a universal moral doctrine, but rather from exclusively associating Western culture with morality. And she proposes a method that she calls non-ideal universalism. So in non-ideal universalism, Cotter argues that we need to focus on how to improve our unjust world rather than imagining an ideal one. Uh, she thinks that non-ideal non universalism should give a picture of what is wrong rather than a picture of what is right. Uh, she says that gender-based oppression is always bad, but there may be different judgments about the presence of oppression in different cases and different views on practical solutions to combating oppression. And lastly, she argues that, quote, a better universalism will have to pay attention to the non-normative assumptions held by those likely to adopt it and the effects normative concepts will produce if adopted under current conditions, end quote. Okay, so that's kind of the nuts and bolts of Cotter's uh, framework or, de or decolonial feminist uh, universalism. How might we apply uh, Cotter's framework to the classical open borders debate? Uh, I have some suggestions. First of all, I think that we should consider whether open and closed borders proposals would reduce oppression in particular contexts and circumstances rather than present them as universal policy proposals. I actually think that many open borders theorists have made this argument, but when the literature is viewed comprehensively, it's, they, they tend to be regarded as, as these kind of whole theories. We should reject um, within our open board, uh, the open borders debate Western idealizations and false universalism, noting that within this debate, it's usually Western borders or the absence of Western borders that are presented as really the only uh, two options. And we might, following Cotter, question whether we might craft a kind of universalism from below based on non-Western bordering practices. Uh, just to kind of give a, a little bit of a, a suggestion for how we might think um, along, using non-Western philosophy and think about borders and bordering practices, just a quote from uh, the philosopher Viola Cordova, her theory of bounded space. Um, Cordova was the first uh, Native American woman to get a PhD in philosophy. I'm a Hikarila Apache philosopher. She has a theory of bounded space. She's not theorizing borders as we know and talk about them today, but she, she argues in her book how it is that Native Americans did not think of their homelands as something they owned, but as something they belonged to. So it's kind of a different way of thinking about the relationship between peoples and the lands, right? And I just offer it as an example of an alternative way that we might think about borders uh, and bordering practices or the relationships between people and land. Okay, so I won't go through all of these objections one by one, but uh, I would like to suggest that if we if we use Cotter's decolonial feminist ethic, um, we have good resources for responding to a lot of these feminist objections to getting involved uh, in the open borders debate, right? A lot of this is about framing and certain background assumptions, but we can actually use decolonial feminisms to have what I think could be a very worthwhile feminist intervention in the debate. Okay. Happy to, I mean, I'm happy to kind of go back and, and talk about this later, uh, but, but that, that's my suggestion for now. Um, and to conclude, let me talk about some additional, I mean, I have a little bit more discussion because the, the last part of this is to actually motivate a feminist getting involved in the debate. Not just saying like, look, you have this, one might have this hesitancy and I think that uh, we shouldn't be so hesitant, but I think there are important reasons why we need feminist perspectives on the open borders debate. First of all, I don't think that we should assume so quickly that our current Western vision of open borders is necessarily the most radical, progressive, humanitarian, and feminist immigration policy that one can have. This is something that's come up sometimes um, in different, uh, actually not when uh, talking with immigration philosophers, but I've noticed that there's a move to kind of assume that a certain vision of open borders is, is kind of the best that we can do, and anything that's not operating within that framework is somehow kind of complicit in, in imperialism, right, and um, kind of uh, the violence of 
borders. And so I don't think that we should use that position to shut down alternatives. And I think that's actually happening on the ground. Also, relatedly, non-Western approaches to borders and boundary keeping or to the very idea of opening borders might prove to be more fruitful. I also think that the open versus closed borders manner of framing the classical open borders debate may ultimately prove detrimental to certain feminist goals. I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, so this is just kind of a familiar move within feminist theory, but usually, e even though, again, I think that open borders theorists and closed borders theorists have views that are much more nuanced than that tend to be appreciated, I think that the debate, when we think about the, the literature comprehensively, it's, like, I mean, it's, it's open versus closed borders, and that's a problematic dichotomy, right? So to cite um, Raya Prokovnik's uh, work, Rational Woman, a Feminist Decri uh, Critique of Dichotomy, she argues that dichotomies such as reason, emotion, and man, woman, represent fundamental polarities fixed deep within Western philosophy and reflected in the structures of our language, and that the two polarities also represent two expressions of hierarchical power relations expressed in social practices and patriarchal society. And so in bringing this literature to mind, I want to say perhaps there are some kind of nuanced proposals that are being lost given the open versus closed borders framing of the debate. Okay. I also believe that um, a kind of a more explicit kind of feminist understanding of the open borders debate would be really good for feminist political philosophy. Um, and so, uh, so I, I think that if, if we look at um, the way in which uh, debates about uh, borders have played out in kind of different areas, different schools of thought and political philosophy, we see, for example, debates about what liberal political philosophy should ultimately say about borders. Um, libertarians have made borders kind of central in certain ways, right? Does being a libertarian mean that you're committed to open borders or not? Right. Of course, for communitarians like Walter, you know, borders um, are kind of central concerns of communitarian theory. I don't think that feminist political philosophy has done that. That's kind of my view. I don't think that there are kind of clear feminist debates and positions on borders. And I actually think that developing feminist perspectives on borders could be really helpful for understanding the relationship between kind of women and the patriarchal state. OK, so, uh, so lastly, um, I believe that feminist decolonial and universal approaches to immigration justice could help us imagine the role of borders and immigration restrictions in both decolonial and climate futures that don't always have clear local solutions. So this is my last kind of reason why I think that we need more feminist interventions in the debate. So thinking about borders in decolonial futures, thinking about land back, uh, land back movements, for example, here, I, I quote here a land back, a Native American land back um, activist, Amy Smoke from the Kitchener Waterloo land back movement who argued most settlers think that we're asking for it all back, that everybody needs to go home to their countries of origin. That's not necessarily true. We are looking for sovereignty, the ability to govern ourselves, the autonomy to create our own structures, take care of the land the way that we once did. I think that, that land back movements, which are uh, the, the philosophies are which are often very rich and complicated and nuanced, that doesn't always get appreciated when we talk about them demonstrates the need for this kind of decolonial universalist thinking, right? Because thinking about land back, it involves working within non-ideal theory. You have to be attentive to you know, the way that coloniality has historically operated, right? In the state of indigenous communities today. But really when you're trying to theorize what land back would look like, we don't really have clear local solutions to what that should entail. We have to kind of imagine a very different future um, in which kind of a form of land back would take place. So we do need a kind of non-ideal universalism to imagine something that's very different and have these bigger debates about kind of borders and immigration justice, but we also have to kind of start from the bottom up. And so I think that feminist interventions could be really useful here. Similarly, in, in and thinking, right, should borders be part of a framework for developing plausible scenarios of climate for adaptation, mitigation, and sustainability efforts at local, regional, and global scales? Once again, thinking about borders and climate futures involves working within non-ideal theory. You have to think about the realities of climate change, but also imagine a very different world that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't so closely resemble the world in which we live today. So to conclude, um, the universal questions of the classical open borders debate, namely, is there a universal human right to global migration? And could borders and immigration enforcement mechanisms ever be just, have not been explored from a feminist perspective, even though feminist and decolonial scholars have been carefully developing a kind of ethics of borders. And I think I've argued that this is likely because feminists have some good reasons to object to aspects of the framing of the classical open borders debate. 
But I've argued that if we approach the classical open borders debate using tools from Serene Cotter's framework of non-ideal universalism, we can address these objections, mainly by noting that the classical open borders debate understood comprehensively um, contains a false universalism that's based on Western values and institutions. I've also argued that there are additional reasons for feminists to engage the classical open borders debate. One, to potentially develop better policies. Two, to work past this kind of dichotomous framing of the debate. Um, three, to figure out what feminist political philosophy actually wants or doesn't want from borders. And four, to explore whether and to what extent borders should play a role in decolonial and climate futures. Um, I have some questions, you know, if, if there were to be feminist uptake of this debate, some questions that we might explore, maybe you have some thoughts on them, right? We should explore how have non-Western societies conceived of borders and bordering practices. Um, if we move past Western idealizations, can we find a kind of universalism from below that can help us answer the questions of the classical open borders debate? What solutions, what might we find beyond this dichotomy? Are borders always manifestations of power as power over? Can open borders ever co uh, constitute a form of power over? Should borders play any role in decolonial and climate futures? How do borders harm or help women and other marginalized groups? And how else might we occupy the open borders debate? So again, I think that this is a really important debate. These are really important questions to take up. I think there's a need for feminist perspectives on these questions. And I, I appreciate your attention and look forward to hearing any questions that you might have. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.